Friday, 6.30 a.m. I still haven't tested any USB cables. The mad dash to the video must start. It's like this every week. Ha. I have a whole bunch more USB cables to look at today. The big deal today is I'm looking at EPR or extended power range cables to see if they are made any better and if they can beat out the existing 100 watt competition. Obviously, it is impossible to cover everything and I'm absolutely sure I missed thousands of cables and options. I went with cables that didn't obviously look fake or cables that came with other products. The previous videos have some background context that I will not be going over here today. So if you found this video first, there's a link in the description to the previous ones. I'll be testing each for resistance, arguably one of the most important factors for a piece of wire that carries DC power. In this series, I try to answer the question, which power cable do I want to get? The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The performance is measured and compared to near competitors to see how each one stacks up. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Patreon is now live as well as the super button, thanks to my current patrons. So I have a lot of USB cables, as usual. I'm sure I have squirreled away more cables somewhere that I didn't test for this round, but I have to draw the line somewhere and arbitrarily this line is drawn at 66 cables, well 65. One has two tests. So rather than drone on about data, I'm going to go through this one a bit different. If you want background material, as mentioned, watch the previous video in the series. So the first unique cable of the day is this multi-tip USB cable. This thing is going to give me trouble, I can just smell it. I set it up on my test jig and no surprises, it won't pass any voltage at all. This cable has one USB input and two USB outputs. It has a little box in the middle to distribute power. It looks like there isn't a way to negotiate power into this thing. So on my normal test jig, it isn't going to work. The power adapter will have to come out and I'll have to rig something up to be able to measure the voltage drop manually across this cable. I have a current of about 2.5 amps flowing through the cable with an adapter board that taps the USB connections. I can measure the voltage in and then measure the voltage out on the USB negotiation board. Then to get resistance, you just take the voltage and divide by the current. I am using milliohms, so multiply by 1000 after doing that math. This cable, after going through all that trouble ends up being a good performer resistant wise. It looks like whatever switching they are doing is fairly efficient. It looks like this cable will swap back and forth though, so it looks like it will do 100 watts on one port, then 5 volt only on the other port, or nothing. The USB tester had no idea what to make of this cable, but it is certainly a pretty unique one, and it obviously negotiates to 100 watts, but only if it is pre-powered. The tester can't read the chip. I kind of wish this functioned a little bit different. Only losing about 3 watts under a 100 watt load is very impressive though. Very low resistance at about 130 milliohms. The Yiptan magnetic tip adapters and cables have something I haven't seen yet. These pass high speed data and 100 watt power. It is like you don't have to lose anything to transfer information and power with that magnetic tip. I might actually make use of this adapter, if nothing else, to save my USB-C port from wear and tear. So how does this do resistance wise? Well, the adapter adds about 50 milliohms total, so about one watt of loss at 100 watts, which is really not bad at all. The cable with the adapter obviously loses a bit more. This one isn't the strongest performer by any means at about 200 milliohms and about five watts of loss at 100 watts, but it adds convenience. So this may be a great option for lower power devices that don't need a lot of current to charge. The adapter here makes more sense than the cable. The tips are strong enough magnets to make the connection and don't appear to disconnect with the little rattling of the connector. They are not too strong, so if the cable gets caught on something, it will easily disconnect and not cause a problem. I like these overall. They seem like a really high quality option for a magnetic connection to your device. I'm probably just gonna stick with a normal charging cable though. To use power delivery with extended power range or EPR, you need a different cable. The cable has to have an e-marker chip in it that allows for negotiation with both the power adapter and the device plugged in for voltages higher than five volts. In this case, extended power range covers 28, 36, or 48 volts, fixed values, or a variable range from 15 to 48 volts. Cables that have this extra ability are usually marked with 240 watts on the case, but some of these aren't real. The 240 watt power capability hasn't been realized yet on a single cable, but when it is, the loss actually won't be any higher because the current won't be any higher. The voltage increases instead, which means the current potentially could be even lower, leading to more efficient power transfer. Okay, let's get into some 240 watt cables. Orico 240 watt cables were one of the first ones I was able to find and they're a little bit unique in that they came with a leather cable tie. I haven't seen that before, seems a bit wild. 
Anyway, these cables are very thick. They also claim to be data cables for some very high data rates. They all accurately test as 240 watt USB power cables. Nice, no fakes here. There are a bunch of unbranded 240 watt cables as well that I picked up, mostly found on eBay, since these weren't available on Amazon at the time of cable gathering, and much to my surprise, all of these seem real as well. Some are quite reasonably priced, and performance-wise, they are all solid upper average performers. This was another request. I haven't done many of these, but this extension cable seems to do the business. In this case, it provides low added resistance while allowing high-speed data to pass through the cable. If you extend these cables too far, you may end up with data integrity issue, but at least for this short extension, it looks like you won't lose too much in power and it'll do the job required. The Anchor 140 watt rated cables are a bit of a sore spot. Why did Anchor release a cable that is essentially e-waste with their product? The chip in the cable, as mentioned, does have to be changed to be able to access the extended power range modes, and this cable can do that up to the 28 volt mode, but is it hiding something? Let's plug it into the USB tester to find out if this is really a 240 watt cable hiding in a 140 watt shell. And it looks good. This is really a 240 watt EPR cable, not a 140 watt cable. So this was really just marketed wrong. I can understand why this was done though, since the only devices on the market were 140 watts at the time. So it may have been confusing to have a 240 watt cable with a 140 watt device. If any of those higher power level adapters come out, we can give it an official test to see if it melts or doesn't work at those modes in reality. In terms of resistance, this cable is actually quite good. For one meter, it is one of the best options out there, but it is a charging only cable. This in-charge adapter is another neat little device. This is a multi-tip adapter that keeps everything neat in a compact package. This was a suggestion and I figured it would be a great addition to test. It has a USB-C to C, a USB-A to C and built in as well as an Apple Lightning tip. I didn't test that. The USB-C to C does have an e-marker chip in it so it will negotiate to 100 watts. You'll have to get pretty close to use it though since if you ask me this cable is a little too short. It actually doesn't fit in any of my testers for continuity since it is too short. But having a legacy USB-A when needed is nice. Then being able to adapt to USB-C for more modern devices is great. I don't think I'd use this as a primary cable, but in a pinch, it's a nice to have. Onto some more Apple cables. I had requests for monoprice cables, so I picked up a bunch of different ones and also threw in some others that slipped in over time. The fun ones that I got are these 15 and 25 foot long USB-A to lightning cables. Overall, the monoprice cables didn't do bad. Actually, they have the most efficient offering of anything I've tested, and it's a short cable though. Obviously, the really long USB cables did worse, but really not crazy bad considering the length of the cable. They aren't the worst of the bunch. It would be better to just extend the power outlet though, and use a shorter USB cable. Hopefully, Apple will just make the switch to USB-C finally. So graphs and things. The scatter plot is fun. The data will be on the All Things One Place webpage if you want to download it and play around with it. It will be set up as a Google Sheet to make it a little easier for people to steal, I mean use. In general, the cables that fall below the line are what you want to get for goodness of low resistance. The cables that are above the line are fairly lossy and either won't charge your device at full speed or will just waste too much power. If we take this one step further and look at the winning cables versus cost, we can see which cable represents the best value and lowest resistance. So from that, the winner circle. That's it. Yeah, shorter cables generally mean lower resistance, so the winners tend to be shorter cables. I'm not going to differentiate these too much. As mentioned, the data is online, so peruse at your own pace. I didn't find anything terrible except that one fake cable, which I already had a short out on. The rest basically are all pretty strong performers. I had one not so great micro B cable, but otherwise all cables work and do the job required without causing any major issues. Some of the other cables may fall out of tolerance with the specific USB standard for resistance values, but in general, most of these cables didn't make claims of compliance with that, so I'm not sure if fault can be put on them for not meeting requirements there. In general, the Yiptan seems like a pretty good option for a magnetic connection. Quite a bit more premium than the other ones I tried looking at before. These offer data transfer as well as power and don't seem to offer too much additional loss while accomplishing convenience. The short adapter cable is a little too short if you ask me, but it does work. If you needed a cable in a pinch, it'll do the job. Anchor, for some reason, didn't really seem to know what they were talking about with the 140 watt rated cable because it seems to have the proper chip to go all the way to 240 watts. No idea. Maybe it was just too early days and they wanted to match the power adapter. Good to know the cable is actually not bad. Actually, the cable that comes with the power adapter is one of the best EPR cables I have found so far. So again, 
data on the All Things One Place webpage linked in the description. I probably will not do another video on USB cables unless something very interesting comes along. I will continue to add to the list of tested cables though. Maybe do a short once in a while. I feel like I've beaten this dead horse until there aren't even flies left. Thanks for watching. Rolling a die next week for a video. Power adapter, power bank, random electronic items, no idea, but tune in to find out. Check my website for upcoming videos. There's a schedule of release dates. I have too many more electronic things and many more videos in the future. Goodbye.